Ready. And welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I call to order the Clackamas County Board of Commissioners business meeting. And uh, Mr. Krupp, our county administrator, will do the roll call. Well, good morning, commissioners. We are joined this morning uh, with Mr. Stephen Madcor, county council, and Mary Rathke, our clerk of the board. Commissioner Bernard. Present. Commissioner Smith. Aye. Commissioner Savas. I'm present. Oh, good. Yeah. Commissioner Schrader. Yeah. Chair Ludlow. Here, would you all please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about, before we begin, about the small grants program. The goal of the Small Grants Program is to assist organizations whose purpose is to help the most vulnerable residents of Clackamas County. The focus is to fund small projects that would aid these entities to better serving their target populations. These projects shall demonstrate the ability to become self-supporting or shall illustrate that the grant request is for a one-time expense. This program supports agencies that are making an effort to develop and implement innovative projects that would address the following goal, to help the most vulnerable families, seniors, and others meet their basic needs, such as food assistance and abuse prevention. We'll now show a video from one of our small grant recipients from last year. Sycamore Lane is more than a picturesque slice of Clackamas County. It's also a premier equine therapeutic riding center. It's amazing. It improves um, mood, affect, um, physical ability, um, social interaction. There's so many benefits um, that come with, with equine therapy. It, it's hard to, you know, categorize them all. One of the newer programs at Sycamore Lane, and one funded in part by a Clackamas County Board of Commissioners small grant, provides equine therapy for veterans struggling with physical or emotional difficulties. A disabled Army veteran who was seriously wounded twice in Iraq, Eric Bramwell has had trouble holding jobs and reintegrating into civilian life. Because of my disability, I struggle a lot with um, depression, anxiety. Uh, I've had four knee surgeries now, a traumatic brain injury. I lost uh, about 55 guys in my unit. Um, my best friend, he, he died from getting shot in the back 30 times by one of our guys. Uh, you know, so for a long time, I didn't want to come out of my room. I didn't want to go anywhere. And so for me, my biggest issue is, is feeling like I belong again to society, uh, feeling like I have a purpose again. Um, and before coming out here, I didn't really have that. And this place has really given me a, a safe place to uh, really kind of take foot in my life again and, and start moving forward to deal with all the stuff that I've been through. And there's just some sort of connection that, that happens uh, when you're working with these horses. The founder and executive director of the 80-acre facility, local surgeon Suzanne Cleland Zamudio, grew up right here. 
Her family raised horses on the property. She established the center in part because her autistic son was not responding to traditional therapy. She and her husband invested their own money to build the facility. We decided to cash in one of our retirement investments to build this facility. And, uh, and that's never a small decision, but um, this is something we believe very strongly in, serving people with disabilities and serving veterans. And so for my family, this is like a dream come true. The nonprofit facility opened in 2009, serving six autistic children. They now have up to 85 participants per week with disabilities of all kinds. There's a beginning and intermediate curriculum for veterans, which involves much more than riding. Before they ever mount a horse, they go through a number of exercises that promote bonding and trust with the animals. That relationship can be more powerful in affecting PTSD than traditional forms of therapy. One of my favorite times of the week is coming down here. So really out here, the horses have become our therapists. And through working with a the horse, they can develop confidence, they can relearn how to build a relationship with someone. Um, horses are great. They read our feelings and emotions and respond to them, but they don't judge like many people might feel a human is doing to them. Um, so the veterans can interact with the horses, they can bond with the horses, um, they can teach the horse something and through that maybe learn something about themselves. There's something very calming about being around an animal that has this much power and, and connecting with it and it, it puts you at ease and it teaches you to keep keep control of yourself and of, you know no matter what happens around you because if you spook then the horse is definitely going to and you know just just keep it all you know nice easy even energy and everything's just fine just like the rest of life. Sycamore Lane received a county small grant because their program reflects the effort of the Board of Commissioners to enhance services to all veterans here. I expressed to Clackamas County that not only do we need money for wounded warriors who have exhausted their funding they can get, but I want to be able to serve all veterans. And that's not just horseback riding, that's counseling, that's group counseling, that's camaraderie. They come out here and they have a great time together. And it's great to see them feel embraced by uh, not just the community, but um, a place they can go where they just feel safe and, um, and uh, um, relaxed. You know, I'm not on my own. I've got people that actually do care and they want to help me. You know, and this, this place, Sycamore Lane, has been huge, just stepping stone for a lot of vets just to start getting out there and going, okay, you know what, I'm not useless. And if I can pass it along to any other veterans, you know, if we can use that money to get more veterans involved to, to show them that, hey, you know what, you can still have purpose in life, you know, just because you're disabled or something has happened to you, you know, it doesn't mean that your life is over. Well, do bear in mind that Sycamore Lane... They... Sorry. Somebody's speaking to me. Oh, oh well, let me do that. <laughs> Sycamore Lane is in desperate need of finances to continue operating, so if you have... Uh, have the heart to do that, we certainly appreciate you giving a gift to them. Our small grant uh, amounts are limited to $15,000. And uh, you can find more online at clackamas.us forward slash bcc forward slash small grants dot html. I think Mary's going to display something here in a second. But now from tomorrow, you only have one more month to apply for this grant to August 15th at 5 p.m. For more information, call Caroline Hill at 503-655-8261 or email her at carolinehill at clackamas.us. And again, you can apply online as indicated. Uh, Commissioner Smith. Thank you. <clears throat> Two budget cycles ago, there would be one year now, we uh, at the BCC in our budget deliberations uh, raised the amount of our grants, 50000 to 250000 because the need was so great. We felt that um, since this is taxpayer money, taxpayers are asking for it back to them, and this is one of the better ways that we can help serve our communities uh, by having people give us ideas on how they want their money spent. And, um, and I will continue to fight to make sure that that fund stays exactly where it is, if not increased, so we can help people like our returning veterans and many other, other 
uh, worthy uh, nonprofits or situations in the county. We've often bought refrigerators and freezers to, for food and when the re recession was so bad and people were out of work and, and we've helped different, uh, different volunteer efforts throughout the county. So please, if you have an idea, uh, give us a call, vet, vet it out, make an application. We'd really appreciate it. Thank you, Commissioner Bernard. I actually got kind of got the idea for this back a uh, number of years ago when I used to attend our networking groups, and I was amazed how many uh, how many groups were out there working with the community. I think you know there'd often be fifty different groups there, and all of them were trying to figure out how to get money to continue their projects. But one of the things I think is important about this is that we actually, as a commission, don't go through each grant. We have a, a team that makes that decision and then recommends it to us, and we've changed a little bit sometimes. And we even had one that uh, withdrew their application, and uh, that money went back into that, uh, uh, you know, one of those other applicants. So I think it's a really good process, and Caroline um, has headed that up, and I think uh, she's just really done a fantastic job. Yep, yes, she great has. job. All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for citizens' communication. Oh, my goodness. There is nobody here that wants to talk to us, and that's ex extremely rare, or talk at us. I'm not sure. But we're going to get into the consent agenda. I'll ask the clerk to read the consent agenda by title. Okay, the consent agenda. Under Health, Housing, and Human Services, approval of amendment number one to the intergovernmental agreement with the State of Oregon Department of Human Services for the operation of the jobs program. Approval of a grant agreement with the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development Supportive Housing Program for the Rent Well Rapid Rehousing Program. Approval of a grant agreement from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development Continuing of Care Program for the Jackson Place Program to pr provide transitional housing and services for the homeless. And approval of a grant agreement from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development Continuum of Care Program for the HOPE Leasing Program for the purpose of providing permanent housing. Under elected officials, approval of previous business meeting minutes. Under juvenile, a request for approval to be a subrecipient for the University of Oregon's Restorative Justice in Schools Program grant application funded by the National Institute of Justice. Under the Development Agency, approval of a First Amendment to the Disposition and Development Agreement with Lanus Development for Real Property Acquisition. Under Water Environment Services, approval to renew an agreement to furnish engineering services to Clackamas County Service District Number 1 with Rich Wine Environmental Inc. for wastewater process engineering and technical assistance. And approval to renew an agreement to furnish engineering services to the Tri-City Service District <coughs> with Rich Wine Environmental Inc for wastewater process, engineering, and technical assistance. And that concludes the consent agenda. All right, commissioners, any concerns about any of those or would like to remove any of those from the consent agenda? I'll entertain a motion. I move we approve the consent agenda. Second. Motion by Commissioner Smith, seconded by Commissioner Bernard. Any further discussion? All right, Mary. Commissioner Bernard. Aye. Commissioner Smith. Aye. Commissioner Schrader. Aye. Commissioner Savas. Aye. Chair Ludlow. Aye, passes 5-0. And now, you know, after this exciting meeting, a rather abbreviated one, it's always exciting to hear from our county administrator about something uplifting in the county. I have uh, some other good news to share for you this morning, Mr. Chair. And uh, the first is, is uh, uh, related to our housing authority. Uh, we received a $30,000 grant to start a loan assistance program that uh, would assist Section 8 families looking for housing. The grant comes from the Memorial, uh, the Meyer Memorial Trust, and the Housing Authority is expecting to have the program up and running by this September. And uh, my thanks to the Housing Authority staff for being able to qualify and secure that grant. Nice. Then our uh, uh, Water Environment Services Department received a $20,000 grant from Energy Trust of Oregon to uh, help us conduct research 
that would help uh, reduce energy costs and minimize the uh, carbon footprint of the Tri-City plant, and as a result, it will allow us to increase revenues uh, there. The study will analyze the cost effectiveness of utilizing methane gas, um, it's, which is a byproduct of the treatment process, uh, to produce electricity and heat for other various uses at the plant. Uh, the research will also allow us to analyze the feasibility of treating waste from restaurants and other businesses in concert with uh, the use of biogas, which could produce some additional revenue uh, to the, uh, to the uh, utility. And then finally, the uh, Sheriff's Office uh, joined forces with the Special Olympics of Oregon um, last week for the 30th Annual Law Enforcement Torch Run. And the six-mile race benefits uh, the uh, Special Olympics Oregon, which uh, held its summer games uh, last weekend in, in Newburgh. Uh, so my thanks to the Sheriff's Office for supporting the, uh, this group, uh, this great group, for uh, making sure our special local athletes can experience the joy and camaraderie of participating in the sports they love. That's my report. Thank you. Time for a Commissioner's communication. We'll start with Commissioner Schrader. Uh, yeah, I've actually had a busy week. Um, had conference calls with folks from the National Association of Counties as we prepare for the conference that's going to be happening uh, next week down in Long Beach, California. And largely, I've been working on the steering committee dealing with economic development and workforce development. And one of the things that will be moving forward is a resolution that I have been working on uh, with Chuck Robbins dealing with new HUD requirements that are requiring a broader regional approach to housing. And the issue is, once again, is that we are required to do more paperwork, more work, <laughs> check off more boxes uh, with what we perceive to be an unfunded mandate. So we will be moving forward with a resolution down there saying that, indeed, we want to meet the criteria that HUD puts forward for regional housing and regional planning for that housing, but there needs to be some uh, uh, bucks, uh, some, some dollars associated with that so we can do the job that we are required to do. Um, the other thing is we had a tourism board meeting the other day, and um, there's been uh, interesting discussions about a whitewater park. I don't know if that's going to come to fruition or not. However, the context I am putting it in is that uh, as we move forward with, and Commissioner Smith has been working very hard on this as well, with the legacy project uh, in our area, water recreation will be a component of that, whether it takes the form of a whitewater park, whether it takes the form of still water, flat water kayaking, whatever, but there will be a component that um, actually does reflect the fact that it's a big river, it's a big falls, and uh, the culture and history of that uh, dealing with water and fishing and recreation will be uh, carried forward. We just have to put it in the context of a larger project, and we're working on that, right, Tootie? I think that's a that's a good one. Um, I also wanted to share something personal this week that that happened to me, and I think some of you folks got to meet my uh, my sister from the Philippines. And way back in 1970, I was an American Field Service student for three months in the little village of Miagao on the island of Iloilo Ilo, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the Philippines. And I found out, uh, because of the character of the community and the church, it's now a World Heritage Site. But when I was there, <laughs> it was just a, a big, you know, it was just a, a smaller community with a big church in the piazza in the middle. And um, it was very interesting. I remember one day, my, my famous story is there was a little goat on the street, and the next day I was eating the goat. So, I mean, there you go. It was uh, kind of a <laughs> And it was a delicacy, just to let you know. It was, <laughs> it was a delicacy. But I reconnected with my host sister and her, her family after uh, close to 40 years. They came to visit me. I'm going to go down and visit with them in Long Beach. And the reason why uh, the American Field Service is so important, it was the first intercultural exchange program, really, uh, that's na international that was established. The American Field Service was a 1915 ambulance corps group in the First World War. And they felt, uh, basically, after the Second World War in 1947, that they needed to do something to foster world peace and intercultural understanding, and the best way to do that was to influence 
uh, young people to go to different cultures and actually kind of get embedded embedded in that culture. And um, it's still going on. I, there's still American Field Service students, if you want to host one, um, look up the website and do it. I, I know I'm considering it at some point, but um, <laughs> we'll see. You know, we have a busy life as commissioners at this point. But at this point, they have given more than 400,000 students and young adult professionals the opportunity to travel abroad, have a personal growth experience that continues for a lifetime. And it truly does. Um, once you go to a different culture, it's transformative. Um, it gives you a whole new perspective. I remember the Vietnam War was going on when I was in the Philippines. That was, it was a whole new, uh, being so close to that was, was um, you know, kind of transforming and life changing. And it influences you pretty much for the rest of your life. So I was very glad to see my host sister. She's got 10 grandchildren. I only have two, so she's got me beat in that. And um, the other thing I'll mention is that my parents also helped them get to the United States because at oh. the time they needed sponsorships. These were folks who were physicians, they were nurses, they were medical technicians, um, and they wanted, they wanted to immigrate here. So, um, you know, my, my mother and father, bless their hearts in the hospital system they worked in, really helped out to make sure that those folks have a life here in America, and so now everyone is American citizens in nice. California. So very nice. Yeah, I've been, I'm a very lucky person, aren't I? Yeah, work with good people and have good experiences. Okay, arts and culture activities. Um, I'm gonna uh, um, have our, the chair do that once again. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh okay, there you go. Boy. Okay. Arts and culture activities in the county. Mary Charlotte's Garden Party. Enjoy live music, tour the historic farm on the Oregon Trail and learn about 19th century fashions. Kids and grandkids will enjoy the hands-on activities like corn grinding, croquet. Corn. Well, I'd forgotten that, <laughs> that yeah, word. Yeah. Cross-cut sawing and building a log cabin. Saturday, July 16th, one to four, at Philip Foster Farm in Eagle Creek. Uh, the West, Time, West Lynn Old Time Fair, and they do have a parade, by the way, the event features old-time basketball game or baseball game, parade, musical performances, historical groups, information booths, and public art dedication of the grindstone sculpture. Friday through Sunday, July 15th through 17th, coming weekend at Willamette Park in West Lynn. For inf or more information about any event, go to Arts Alliance website at clackamasartsalliance.org. Thank you, Martha. All right. The next up is Commissioner Savas. Yeah, well, I went to a couple meetings yesterday, one being the North Clackamas County Parks and Recreation District and um, discussing uh, some possible projects in, the, uh, in that area, and uh, which covers actually uh, Milwaukee, Happy Valley, and unincorporated Clackamas County from the Lamette River all the way to um, about 172nd. And uh, followed by that, there was a, a real, uh, real fun meeting last night with some library folks over there in Oak Lodge, and uh, Commissioner Bernard was in attendance as well. And I was very impressed with uh, the work that they have done, this Oak Lodge Library Advocate Group. Um, really put, to, put together a very uh, comprehensive um, presentation, um, and there's just a lot of energy and excitement uh, about um, what's possible. Um, and uh, just... Uh, a, a real good meeting, um, kind of warm at the firehouse, <laughs> appropriately, uh, but it was it was all good. Uh, I'm also looking forward to the NACO conference, and uh, my focus there will be uh, transportation related stuff, and uh, try to see if we can't get the I-205 project uh, on people's radar um, at the national level. Nice. So that's where we'll all be uh, for the most part of next week. Thank you. Go for it. And now Commissioner Bernard. So. Um, uh, to the Oak Lodge Library uh, meeting last night. Uh, first, I got to say that they did uh, a co comprehensive history of the district, which I will make copies for all you guys, including you. I think it's very good. Uh, it was a really impressive group. And there's probably one thing I learned is that, first, I think we ought to authorize this group to write an open letter to the citizens of Gladstone, inviting them to participate in a discussion about a library. 
uh, there are citizens in Gladstone who are interested in this discussion. We seem to be being blocked by uh, city council. So from my, I think this group, this group would just, I mean, it excited me uh, that the, the interest and desire uh, to do something not only for the unincorporated area, but for the city of Gladstone. Um, and, they're, and they're so close. It's not like it would be, uh, you know, out, uh, a long drive. You'd probably w easily walk or uh, take the bus if you were, if depending upon the location of a future library. But I'll tell you, um, I think we could actually take this off our back, mm -hmm. off our plate, by authorizing this group to invite the citizens in an open letter to a discussion about libraries. I think. I think this is solvable uh, with the help of these folks. Um, one of the issues, uh, and there are people who expressed interest in working on the, uh, what's, what's that called? The, uh, the I wanna say it's the Authorization Act. What's, what's the, how you spend the money? Huh? Appropriations. The master order? Yeah. Yes. Master order. Are interested in working with the county on a master order and uh, spending some of that money for capital with a limited time um, and actually a deadline, <laughs> um, and which would uh, would uh, uh, give perhaps a down payment on a structure, uh, and then we would probably have to invest in in how we're gonna remodel that structure or whatever. Uh, anyway, I, I just think, I was so impressed. I was a couple, a few minutes late and I missed the first part, but uh, one of the presenters was just amazing. She handed out these charts uh, also about what li library sizes are. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's a certain standard, uh, Oh, these are all the same. same. No, they're not. I got they're actually different. Oh, they're yeah. not. They're different. They're different. Oh, anyway, um, it, it it takes a look at at that. You know, the one one thing that's important to note here is that Lake Oswego is 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 a big library, but they also put their own money into it, quite a bit of money. Um, so uh, you can understand why why that would. Uh, perhaps be greater than the, uh, the minimum or a mean. But, uh, you know, there is a great opportunity here and I think we ought to take advantage of it. The other thing is, is that if you look at the proposed uh, library that they're talking about in Gladstone, it's way, way below minimum. And the price per square foot is extremely high. Something's weird about that, and I think we ought to spend a little more time looking at the cost per square foot. Um, and and that and you know, folks have done the calculations and have read the the, the uh, McKinsey report, and uh, they uh, they are pretty uh, well informed, and I think that. If they, if the citizens of Gladstone sat down with this group, those interested, and worked through this, I think there's a solution here that everyone would be excited about. And frankly, the city council in, in Gladstone should be excited about, because there is a solution. And they will get the library that they all deserve. So I, I would love to talk about this in, in, as an issue next week or as uh, set up a policy session. <coughs> they also all agree the 180 days is 180 days and we need to let that go out. But why not start talking with the citizens of Gladstone about some alternative ideas? Because I think if the citizens of Gladstone really got the facts and were excited by these people, Gladstone City Council would be behind it 100%. But it was a great meeting. I'm glad I went, and yes, it was extremely hot in there. And I hadn't eaten dinner, and all they had were these tiny cookies. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Jim. Uh, so uh, 
Anyway, uh, we'll go to uh, Alex. This is Alex, an English Springer Spaniel that you will love as much as he loves you. He will uh, not see, see puppy silliness from him. You will not see puppy. He will see good, you will see good manners. He sits and lays down when asked and offers either paw to shake. Your tender loving care will help him enjoy his retirement years in a comfortable manner. A soft bed, healthy food, and a little exercise, and a gentle pat on the head all sound so wonderful to him. Come meet him tomorrow. For more information about Alex and other adorable adoptable dogs, please contact Clackamas County Dog Services at 503-655-8628 or visit them on the web at www.clackamas.us forward slash dogs. And I've noticed that almost all these dogs are older dogs. Yeah. That one's a little older. I wonder why. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe dog finally owners. gets settled down. That's when you'd want to have I the dog. I mean, yeah. It's, it's harder to catch a younger dog. They run faster. <laughs> okay. That's right. Anyway, have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, we had the Willamette Falls uh, Legacy Partners meeting uh, this Monday uh, discussing what the design is going to look like for the Riverwalk. And a, I think three different uh, drafts will be coming out soon for us to look at on that. And I'm, I'm very anxious. Uh, to see what, what it's going to look like. Uh, also, there's been a proposal, that, a last minute proposal for a <coughs> whitewater park. Uh, it's going it, to, and it, it's quite interesting. I mean, I love the idea and the pictures that they showed. Wow, it could really be something. But maybe at this location, it could be problematic because we've invested hundreds of thousands of dollars this far into permitting it and uh, design. Uh, for the river walk, and I've offered many times, if the folks are interested in a white water situation, maybe at the locks would be a better alternative since that already is a transportation route, and uh, maybe we could gain some excitement over there on the other side of the river where there's a possibility of more parking. And so as we move forward on that, I believe Metro uh, Oregon City and even the state of Oregon will be taking a position on that, and we're going to be discussing it uh, soon. About BCC will be discussing it soon at a, uh, a policy session, and I look forward to that discussion. Uh, last night, MPAC had an interesting tour of the city of Vancouver uh, because we had been hearing a lot about their development and their land use planning and their urbanization uh, their urban revitalization, I should say, of their inner core city. And so um, we listened to them. They gave a slideshow presentation, and then we boarded one of their brand new buses and uh, took a tour of the town within, within the, the city limits. And my hat's off to the city of Vancouver. Um, it, the decisions they made were extremely difficult and was not without fraught and uh, argument uh, but, you know, that's our democratic process. People often criticize us as a board and other boards that, uh, gee, you're not getting along. Well, I think that's where the best sausage is made, by not getting along and, and giving here and taking there um, of ideas. They're going to revitalize. They have a, um, a uh, riverfront area of 13 acres that the city owns, and they're going, they are very aggressively uh, revitalizing that. Uh, the train track had blocked them, and they actually burrowed underneath the train track, made a bridge to allow for uh, public access. They have many city blocks uh, that, uh, that are uh, on cue for revitalization. And they made some very logical decisions on what kind of development they wanted in their downtown because much of it was severely blighted. Uh, Esther Short Park is one of those that has been around. It used to be uh, um, a garbage dump with briar growing all over, and it's very nice looking now. Uh, they want uh, restaurants, entertainment, housing, and a non-retail business, and I do think they will attract it. And the reason that they aren't pushing for retailers in that area is because they have a sales tax and Oregon doesn't. And they recognize the fact for the retail that, uh, that their citizens will just hop on the I-5 bridge, go across, do their shopping, and then come back. So I thought that was fairly intelligent. 
Um, also, they're attracting a professional class, you know, architects, uh, lawyers, uh, that type of stuff, because they do have their government HUD hubs there. The city government hub is there, and the county, Clark County government is there as well. And so I think they have well situated themselves to be, uh, as their, um, their theory behind this was, to be a partner with the Portland metropolitan tri-county area and not be uh, in competition with it, one of the reasons they are not doing retail in their area. So it was really interesting and I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it seeing something through a, a different eyes, uh, just taking it in where I wasn't asked to make a decision. Very fun. Uh, yes, this uh, Saturday is the Westland Old Timers Parade. Starts at 10 a.m. I will have a car and I will have candy, but I need a driver. <laughs> Anybody know of a driver that can drive my car? Uh, I. <laughs> it is my hybrid Hyundai white car, and uh, my driver bogged out the last minute, and the kids and my family are going on a vacation this weekend. My husband is working on the farm. He's behind. I know. Can you believe those people? Just left me stranded. So I'm looking for a driver. What Call a thing me. To I'm on Facebook. I have a website. Send me a message. Thank you very much. I don't think you want to interview very carefully for a driver. I'm just thinking about that. Uh, this last weekend was uh, the 15th year of the Through a Child's Eyes program at Coffee Creek Correctional Facility, which I began. Uh, the, the governor didn't come this year. She came last year, but that was nice of her to come. And um, I'm happy to report that similar programs, like kind programs, have been started in almost every facility in the state of Oregon. We had a national representative back this year um, thinking that this might be a best practice or something they might push nationally. Um, the sheriff has done some, some polling in regards to the local option levy, and um, he'll be bringing that forward to the commission here very soon. We had a um, CCBA, Clackamas County Business Alliance meeting, at which time uh, they, upon a motion by Commissioner Bernard, decided to join the opposition group against initiative petition number 28, basically known as the sales tax. And it is a sales tax, ladies and gentlemen. Took a tour of the Aurora Airport yesterday. You know, they bring millions and millions into Clackamas County, even though they're just barely into Marion County. And uh, in fact, an example of that was Columbia Helicopter. Just the night's stay that they're responsible for every year, or 4,000 rooms every year in Wilsonville. So Clackamas County does benefit from the Aurora Airport, but I was glad to get the tour of that and the tower, which we did the ribbon cutting on, but I never got to see the tower. Pardon me? Is it staffed? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. it was, yeah. well, between the sequential, what's that, what's that called? Sequential? Oh, uh, se yeah, the federal government. Uh, sequester. Sequester, sequester, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, between that and, and some other problems, they finally came up with the $600,000 necessary to build it, and then yes, it is staffed by two gentlemen up there. And what a great view of everything, and I saw a big old uh, giant helicopter, double, double blade helicopter go by. That was pretty dramatic and loud. Um, there's a Fairborn meeting tonight, uh, which I'm the liaison to, and Lipstick, the local public safety coordinating council will be meeting next week, I'll be there for that and the C4 uh, Metro Subcommittee. This last week, we had a presentation from Milwaukee about their downtown area. They're taking in uh, 265 acres. I think that was the figure for an urban renewal uh, district. Uh, I've said my piece about urban renewal before, but it, it is where money is captured that would normally go to public purposes, police, fire, schools, library, parks. And uh, I disagree with it, but Milwaukee is a separate entity and they can do what they wish. Uh, we will have town halls, I'll announce those in a moment. We've decided to move forward with, uh, thus far, by the way, this, the 21st, next Thursday night, we'll have a public discussion on our idea to send a six cents per gas, uh, per gallon gas tax forward to the public. One of the reasons I've decided to have the public discussion is we've heard a lot from cities and other C4 and others, but we have not heard from citizens. And so uh, we want to hear what they think about this idea, and that'll be open to that discussion next Thursday night at 6 p.m. 
Also, we're sending forward the 3% marijuana tax. Um, the tax, the temporary state tax on this will go down to 17%, and cities and counties can add 3% based on the retail sales in their municipality and or county. And so we want to capture that and use that for the purpose of code enforcement, law enforcement, and public health. And so uh, that should be coming forward to a public meeting here uh, in August. So that's about the size of it except for, um, oh yes, the town halls. Now these are themed town halls, we've decided. They will be on the road ahead, that being a ballot measure, and uh, the marijuana tax, the 3%. So we are trying to encourage those who might come to ask us questions about that or make a brief statement and uh, but in a question form to us. Because we, we try to go out and, and, again, literally touch people in more local neighborhoods. But uh, we, we want to make sure that uh, we have something to, specific to talk about and that these are operated with great decorum. And we'll be working on that as well. Ladies and gentlemen, again, the next meeting is next Thursday night um, uh, at 6 p.m. And we will be short down to three commissioners at that time. And I'm sure you'll all be here as necessary. But Martha and Paul will be going down to the NACO conference, as mentioned, down in Long Beach. Somebody's got to do that, right? Uh, <laughs> All right, there being no further business before the commission this day, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>